I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. In this podcast, we explore America's crisis in civic education. Too many people today don't understand the history and principles that make us Americans. So we're here to explore America's history and principles and what they mean for today, what we can learn from them, and how we can restore them to their rightful place in our hearts and minds. We think it's the most important thing we can do as Americans to keep our experiment in self-government alive. So thank you for joining us in this important conversation. You can learn more about Ashbrook and the work we're doing with students, teachers, and citizens at ashbrook.org. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this conversation. Uh, I'm, for those of you who may not know, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center. Ashbrook is an independent educational center located at Ashland University, but we do programs around the country for students, teachers, and citizens. Our mission is to educate our fellow Americans in the history and principles of America and really what those mean for today. Uh, so we like to have these conversations uh, in, our, um, in our series to investigate some important moments in American life, in American history, and what they meant then and what they could mean for us today. We really believe at Ashbrook that education is not about indoctrination, definitely, not about information only, but about conversation, about thinking and discovering the truth for yourself. And we do believe that the best way to do that is through conversation. So I want to invite you into that conversation this evening as we talk about turning points of World War II, as we remember Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, and we honor that day and we think about that great struggle and the importance of it, the meaning of it, and again, what it means for us today. So join us through the Q&A function. We'll take your questions. Always try to get to as many of those as we can during the course of the time. We don't always get to, to everyone, but I'll certainly make as a good an effort as we can to do that. Uh, tonight, we're joined by our good friend, old friend, uh, and World War II expert, Professor John Mosier. John is chair of the Department of History and Political Science at Ashland University. He's the chair of Ashbrook's Master of Arts in American History and Government program, and is a prolific teacher and author on World War II, has written several books and articles on the subject, teaches a World War II class for us, and has led students, actually, on a trip to important World War II battlefields. So John's a great expert in this. We've had him on before, as many of you know, for World War II-themed webinars. Always a terrific guest, terrific conversation. John, thanks for taking the time to join us tonight. Hi, Jeff. It's my pleasure. Always enjoy it. Um, this is titled Turning Points in World War II. Um, what do you mean by the phrase turning points? Yeah, a turning point is one of those terms you hear all the time in, in military history, and, and it's often not made clear what it means. Uh, you know, the turning point of World War II, if I'm going to imitate one of those grizzled old uh, British generals that used to show up in documentaries all the time. Um, there are, as I see it, at least three ways that you could uh, that you could define it. Um, the first would be uh, a, a um, the point at which it becomes impossible for the side that started the war to accomplish its objectives. That's that that would be definition one. The second would be the point at which the strategic initiative uh, moves from one side to the other. That is, up to a certain point in the war, one side is doing all the moving and the other side has to react to it. After the turning point, then it, then that, that, that switches and the other side is a, the side that started the war is assumed to be on the defensive. Uh, those are not necessarily the same battles as those that fall into the first category. And the third, Maybe turning point isn't even the right word for it. These are battles that were that 
probably would not have made a difference in terms of one side or the other winning the war. That is, the Allies were going to win regardless of how these battles turned out. But it seriously would have complicated the Allied war effort had they gone the other way. And we would have, re- we would have ended up with the war being very different, certainly taking longer to, uh, uh, to achieve victory. Okay. Um, in this first category, the point at which the war sort of turns away from the Axis, because of course, historically, it's the Axis that takes the initiative, right? It's the, it's the Germans invading Poland in Europe. It's the Japanese invading China, of course, before the beginning of hostilities, but then of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor and all the other British territories in the Pacific, that, those, that initiative is taken by the Axis in, in the battle, in the war. Yeah, this is my, that's my second definition, but we can start there. It's fine. Well, no, is it what you your your quite your point originally was that first kind of turning point? What are some examples of that? When do those oh, yeah. turning points happen? So, so the the, the first ter- kind of turning point is the point at which it really becomes impossible for Hitler or the rulers of Japan to achieve what they set out to do by starting the war. And I think those battles actually happen before the battles in the second category where the strategic initiative shifts over. Uh, so now that by the way, that's an interesting way to think about it because sometimes you might think that that the strategic initiative has to shift before they can fail to win their objective. but right? you're saying that there was a point at which they couldn't have won their objective, but strategic initiative had not yet shifted back to the allies. Right. And, and, and here's the, the second category is more obvious. The first, it's really only in retrospect that we can go back and say, this is really where Hitler lost. This is where Hitler essentially lost the war. Um, but if you were a contemporary, you notice these big, you know, these, these big battles where the whole tide seems to, uh, seems to change, obviously. And the side that was on the offensive is now on the defensive. So where in this first category? Where are the battles where Hitler and the Japanese began to lose the war? Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna share some maps. Let me uh, go to this one. This is not the one I'm starting with. Here we go. Um, the first of these, I would I would roughly call Battle of Britain. Now, normally when you say Battle of Britain, you're talking about the air campaign over Britain, but I'm I'm talking about several things that were going on simultaneously, not only the air campaign, but perhaps even more importantly, what was going on at sea. Uh, Hitler had actually hoped that after the fall of France, he could get a negotiated end to the war in the West. And just to remind our listeners, John, who are are not World War II experts like you, what year are we talking? What month and year does France fall? Good. So France falls in uh, May, June, 1940. And uh, yeah, it's actually June, mid, mid-June of 1940, France falls. And there's this period of intense danger that really goes from mid-1940 up, th- up through, uh, oh, probably middle of 1941. So roughly one year's, uh, roughly one year's time. And, uh, and part of it is the threat of air attack. Part of it is the more remote threat of a German invasion of the British Isles. Uh, but uh, the, the third and, and most dangerous, in fact, Churchill would say later, it was the only thing that really scared him during the war was the German U-boat threat. Uh, all of these were, uh, were dangerous. Uh, the most likely to have, to have ended the war in 1940 or early 1941 would have been the possibility that German submarines could continue to sink more tonnage uh, of, uh, of, of ships that were carrying much needed goods to the UK than, uh, than the British were able to replace. And that would have been a death by, uh, by strangulation. Uh, Churchill wrote to FDR in December 1940, and he said, okay, first the good news, uh, the, the German air attack failed, there's, they're not going to be able to invade us. However, this is this is what could end uh, could end the war on in Hitler's favor. And and FDR was impressed enough by that letter that he came up with a lend-lease plan within within a couple of weeks. 
So this is this is one critical point where uh, where things could have ended up going going very differently, and Hitler might well have ended up winning the war in that uh, in in that span of time. So this map that we're looking here, what is this showing us? Yeah, this just shows the general situation, especially for the air campaign. It's a little bit difficult in in in, in graphic form. The thing about you know the the Battle of Britain in the skies. You've got all these dramatic encounters, you know, these, these, these pitched air battles. Well, the Battle of the Atlantic was an ongoing thing over months, and it was one where you had to just keep track of statistics. How much food is getting to the UK? How much of the ammunition and weapons that we need are arriving? Uh, what tonnage of, of vessels are being sunk? How many German submarines are being, are, uh, are being sunk? So it, 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 Although there are particular dramatic instances within the, the Battle of the Atlantic, it doesn't have the same level of high drama that the battle that took place in the skies, though I would argue what happened in the Atlantic was ultimately more important. Yeah. So this, the, this, this shows uh, these lines that have been kind of crudely drawn on there show the ranges of the various kinds of aircraft that the Germans had. Uh, one problem that the Germans had was its fighter. It, its fighters couldn't really get past that that green line. Bombers flying beyond that point had to fly unescorted, where of course they were highly vulnerable to uh, uh, to British attacks. So, John, did Hitler think? Did he share Churchill's assessment, which is they're not going to be able to bomb us into submission? They're not going to be able to invade. They're going to have to win by strangling us in the sea. Did yeah. Hitler share that assessment? Do we know, or did he think, for example, they could actually successfully invade Britain? That's a tough one, because he ends up sending orders to plan an, a, an invasion. But but if you actually look at the plans that were developed, they are so far fetched. It's hard to imagine them ever working. They didn't have the landing craft that would have been necessary. Uh, I think Hitler was just sort of. Hitler's position was after the fall of France, hey, this is great. We've won the war. And now we just have to get the British to realize it. And when the British didn't do that, that that in itself threw a monkey wrench into Hitler's plans. Uh, and so he says, well, OK, let's invade. But before we can invade, we have to weaken them by air. Uh, and there were a lot of predictions before the war that air power could win the war on its own. That all you have to do is plaster the enemy cities with enough bombs and you're going to be able to get them to, to surrender. That has never been true, by the way. That, those, those predictions have, have never come true. It didn't work when it went in the other direction with the bombing of German, uh, German cities. Uh, the atomic bombs probably a somewhat different category that we'll get to later. But the, uh, uh, I, I think Hitler did think that he could win through the air and he did think he could win through strangulation through the submarine campaign. But so, but it's but it needs to be remembered. Hitler did not intend to fight a long war. In fact, he always said Germany would be at a huge disadvantage in long wars. So even once Germany was in the kind of war that would take months or years to carry out, even at that point, the chances of Germany winning were were uh, were were greatly diminished. So. Um... Why didn't Hitler succeed in this Battle of Britain by sea? Why didn't he succeed in strangling Britain by sea? Yeah, I, I think a, a lot of it was uh, assistance given by the United States, stepped up aid crossing the uh, crossing the Atlantic. Um, it, it, it it certainly forced the Germans to pay more attention to what was going on far out in the Atlantic instead of just having submarines hovering around the uh, hovering around the shore. Uh, so, uh, I mean, submarines were still a major threat until early 1943, but the, uh, and in fact, they would get worse again. So the sub, the, the probably arguably the worst part of the submarine campaign was after the United States entered the war. Uh, so 1942 was really a bad year for U-boat sinkings. But by that time, the chances that that the U-boats were going to uh, were, were going to win the war for Germany, that had kind of receded by uh, uh, by middle of 1941. And as you say, the key key there was not only the success by sea, but 
as you put it, Hitler saying, now we just have to convince, show the, Brit the British that we've won. And when they didn't accept that they've won, I'm thinking Churchill's stirring rhetoric, right? Uh, and, the, and the national coalition government saying, yeah, we're not going to sue for peace. We're not going to talk terms with Mussolini. Uh, some of our listeners may have seen Darkest Hour, that movie. Um, one of those kind of moments where the British rally themselves and continue on. If you put those two things together, it sounds to me like you're saying that that's what stalled Hitler here in the Battle of Britain. What, but one of my favorite, we're spending a whole lot of time on this on this battle, but it's an important one. One of the uh, one of the most fascinating documents of World War II is a report that Hitler had the the, uh, the chiefs of the Imperial General Staff prepare for him to say can we fight on without France? And the conclusion of that report was, yes, if we can count on help from the United States. And, and, and that, that document was pivotal in convincing Churchill that, that uh, uh, they shouldn't sue for peace. Uh, okay. What's our next turning point here in this first set? Yeah, uh, the next turning point is in the East. It's the battle for Moscow. It took place outside the, the, the capital of the Soviet Union in November, December of 1941. Uh, you know, a lot of people would say Stalingrad is, is the turning point. And, and, and I, are, I would argue that Stalingrad falls into the second category pretty clearly, but not in the first. I think there is good reason for arguing that Hitler could not have won after his failure outside, uh, the failure of the Wehrmacht outside of Moscow at the end of 1941. Uh, up until that point, the German advance had been very rapid. You can kind of see on this map all the territory that they'd taken since since June of 1941. So in a very brief period of time, and uh, and they were stopped outside Moscow. Uh, the, uh, Stalin was able to rush in reinforcements, uh, many of which came from East Asia. Once he learned via spies that uh, Japan was not going to declare war. He was able to transfer a lot of forces from there. Uh, the Germans had already started to become overextended. The Russian winter had started to uh, had, had started to set in. And the German plans had always counted on a, a very rapid attack that would bring down the entire Soviet Union. That would just be so overwhelming and quick. Speed was an absolute an absolute necessity that uh, the campaign was going to be over in the fall. And once it was clear that that was going to happen, that the war was going to go, the war in the East was going to go into 1942, Hitler's chances were greatly, uh, were greatly diminished. Uh, the, the German army was not even supplied with winter clothing because the campaign was supposed to be over by then. Of course, by early December in Moscow, it's very, very cold. Uh, so that this was... Uh, this why did the why did the Germans fail to take Moscow? Well, there are a number of different reasons. A big part of it was uh, there was some there was a strategic debate on the German side, and ultimately it was one that Hitler resolved um, on what the target should be. Many in the German army said the target ought to be Moscow. Right. Once we take Moscow, we could just, we cut the head off the beast, so to speak. The other point of view, and this is one that Hitler started toying with, uh, was that the focus should be on the South. The focus should be on capturing resources. But uh, so he toyed with both of those ideas. He went back and forth. He eventually settled on Moscow, but there was a long enough delay in kind of Stickering over whether to whether to focus on Moscow or the South, that by the time the full scale offensive could be launched, it was it, it was arguably too late. Right? The weather had turned. There were also delays. Uh, there were a host of problems. Hitler would said at one point, "If I'd known this, if I'd known the Soviets had that many men and that many tanks, I wouldn't have invaded in the first place." <laughs> there, there, there was a huge, massive intelligence failure on the German side to, to really appreciate the size of the Red Army, uh, the amount of forces that Stalin could put into the field. I mean, the losses that the Soviets took in the opening months of the war were horrendous, and the Germans are just rolling in, thinking, "Oh, look." This is just as we predicted. We're going to win, no problem. This is a walkover. Guess what? There were a whole lot of forces in reserve, including 
the T-34 tank, which was a truly excellent tank that outclassed anything that the Germans had. So that's the campaign in the East, which of course, I think we sometimes forget as Americans, how that was really where most of the fighting, most of the casualties in Europe actually took place. It was not in the West, but there in the East. At the, um, even after the invasions of Italy and France, the Soviets, uh, sorry, the, the, the Western allies did not face more than say 15% of the German armed forces. The rest of them were all deployed against the Soviet Union. So it, it really was, the war was won or lost on the, in the East. The third of, of your turning point, first turning point battles here. Yeah, that would be Pearl Harbor. That's not often thought about as a turning point. I would never have thought of it like that. Uh, I, I think it is a turning point in two of the three senses, in fact. But here's how it is in the first one. The fact that it happened probably doomed Japan from the start. There is... I see no way that the Japanese could have won a war with the United States. Uh, they might have achieved their objectives had they ignored Pearl Harbor. And you had me talk about Pearl Harbor here a couple of years ago, where I said that, that, that it would have been plausible for the Japanese to attack European possessions in Southeast Asia without hitting Pearl Harbor. And that would have placed Roosevelt in a real jam. He couldn't ask Congress to go to war for the defense of European colonies. Uh, it, it really required an attack on the United States to get the U.S. into the war. Had Japan gone to war only with the British and the Dutch, uh, I, I, that probably offered the Japanese their best, their best chance of winning. But taking on the United States, a country that had about 100 times the productive power, industrial power of, of Japan, uh, it was, uh, uh, yeah, the, the end was, was, was practically preordained. But the Japanese in attacking Pearl Harbor thought, obviously they knew the dif differential in productive power, but as I remember our conversation uh, a couple years ago, you made the point though, that it, they thought that if they could cripple the U.S. Pacific fleet, they could make such rapid advances and take territory that would be, the United States could not recuperate in time yeah. to be able to take it back from them. Yeah. Looking, it looks like here we're looking at Pearl Harbor, the map of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii here. Yes. Um, there was their, their concern, or it's not, sorry, not their concern, the Japanese hope was that Americans would become so demoralized by this and that it would take them so long to recover from the blow that they would throw up their hands and say, eh, you know what, we didn't really need to, uh, have to have a presence in East Asia anyway. Let Japan have its greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. That's something I can mention more about under the third category, because in that sense, even though I don't think there was any way that the, that the Japanese were going to win the war, look, look, look let, let me make it clear. There is no scenario in my mind, no plausible scenario, in which uh, in, in which the United States loses the war in the sense of being occupied by Axis troops. It, you know, the, the man in the high castle scenario was not going to happen. It, 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 it simply, it's simply implausible. It's kind of a fun thought experiment, but, but there's, yeah, there, there's no way it could have, uh, it, it, it could have happened. Um, but, and what I'm looking at here is how devastating a blow was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? It was it was pretty bad. It did serious damage to the Pacific Fleet. But you know what? It, it, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'll, 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 since we're talking about Pearl Harbor anyway, I will I will say why I think it also qualifies in the third category. Uh, had it gone differently, it probably would not have changed the fact that the United States would have won the war. Look, the, the Japanese fantasy that Americans their idea of Americans was you know they're they, they're unloving people who uh, are not warriors at heart. So if we demoralize them, they won't want to fight. That was obviously untrue. However, had they attacked, had they managed to destroy things like the repair facilities and the oil, the oil storage tanks at Pearl Harbor, that really could have have 
delayed the ability of the United States to fight back on top of all the damage to the to the ships itself, because the because Pearl Harbor was a really important base. Had it not had had it been unusable because the repair facilities and oil storage facilities were gone, uh, the, 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 the fleet would have to rebase or what was left of the fleet would have to rebase on the West Coast. And that really would have slowed down operation. It's, it's hard to imagine Midway or the other campaigns that occurred before the end of 1942 and into 1943 happening until much later had that, had that been the case. So the, th the, the third category of, of, of turning points where, uh, you know, it, it, again, the United States was still gonna win, but it would have thrown a real monkey wrench into the uh, in, into the, uh, the, the the victory. It would have it would have taken much longer had it gone the other way. So the attack on Pearl Harbor fits, fits in your first category, which is a, a battle that that they they lost because they started it, <laughs> even if they hadn't lost it. But then they made a strategic miscalculation in not taking out the the Pearl Harbor as a port facility and just trying to attack the ships. That that those two in combination, you're saying, really doomed the Japanese after right. 19, December right. 41. And something else really bad that could have happened was the U.S. carriers could have been there. Um, we it, it was not clear in retrospect. It was it was not clear until later that really the decisive weapon in the Pacific theater was going to be the aircraft carrier and not the battleship. And had the aircraft carriers gotten destroyed, that, too, would have been a massive setback for the United States. All right. So now we're past December 1941. The, the World War II right up runs from in Europe from 1939 to 1945 and the Pacific for America, at least from 41 to 1945. The second category you have for us is points at which the strategic initiative starts to turn in favor of the allies. What are those turning points? These are the ones that that really uh, uh, anyone with a you know with a, with a pretty serious knowledge of World War II that, that are that always come to mind, right? All the textbooks include uh, include these. And the first is the Battle of Midway. Uh, it is, I mean, even though uh, had you know had, by the way, this is a battle that easily could have gone the other way. If you look at the the order of battle. And for those of you who aren't into military history, order of battle just lists the forces on each side. The Japanese had a, had overwhelming superiority in that battle. Uh, had it not been for a massive intelligence coup, that is, the United States knew where the Jap the, the American forces knew where the Japanese forces were, but not vice versa. And uh, a certain amount, actually, a heck of a lot of luck. Um, in, in finding the, uh, the Japanese carriers at a critical time, uh, that war, that battle could have gone very badly and, uh, and, 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 and really delayed victory considerably, considerably. But in terms of uh, that, my, my criteria for the second kind of turning point, one in which the strategic initiative changes, it's really dramatic. Right. The United, the Japanese had a crushing advantage in terms of the number of aircraft carriers in the Pacific, but then lost four of them at, at Midway. And immediately, well, I think the Japanese still had more, but, but the advantage had shrunk by so much. And even more importantly than the loss of the carriers was the loss of the aircraft and the loss of the pilots. Japanese pilots were uh, uh, naval air pilots were went into training from the, the age of 14 they were absolutely uh, they, they were they were terrific pilots they were as, as well trained as pi as any pilot in any point in history uh but the cream of the japanese naval air service was was wiped out along with those carriers at, at, at midway and 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 uh from that point on every time you had u.s pilots matched up against japanese pilots it, it was always kind of a lopsided affair because uh, they, they 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 didn't have the training they didn't have the the japanese pilots didn't have the training or the expertise for the rest of the war so that's well, I did well, okay, then at that point, though, in June 4th of 1942, they do have their best people out there. 
we've got our people there who probably do not have the same level of training, right? Because we're just in the war as in December of 1941. This is only six months later. Why did the United States win the Battle of Midway? Well, uh, it, for one, as I mentioned before, there was this intelligence coup uh, that the United States knew that Japanese forces were going to, to hit. Midway. How do we know that? Ah, through the, it was magic. <laughs> and I mean, not, I mean, the, the name of the program was, uh, was called magic. It was a code name for uh, the, the code breaking operations uh, to break Japan's naval code. And um, boy, we, I, we could spend an, easily spend an hour talking about Midway. It's a, it's fascinating, but even well before the battle, most of the code had been broken, except U.S. code breakers did not know what the code for specific place names were, what those code words were. So they knew it was going to be a major Japanese attack, but where? And well, there was a suspicion that it was going to be midway. So uh, the uh, uh, so U.S. forces sent a, a fake broadcast saying that the water purification plant is malfunctioning on Midway. Immediately, the Japanese were, there was Japanese radio traffic in code. And in that way, they said, aha, this is the code for, this is the code for Midway. We know that's where they're going. The Japanese had sent a decoy fleet toward the Aleutians. It was a little more than a decoy. They actually seized the islands of Atu and Kiska. But their hope was they would draw the, the, the fleet that, uh, in that direction. Uh, so you had this massive Japanese task force, carriers, battleships, the whole nine yards. Near Midway, the U.S. fleet goes directly to Midway. and But even then, you're talking about thousands of miles of open ocean. It's hard to find the enemy. And, uh, you know, a group of... Uh, a, 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 a group of, uh, of, of of bombers first found them. They were all shot down, but those planes I were able to to radio back where the uh, uh, where the Japanese forces were exactly. Uh, and so suddenly you had these dauntless dive bombers screaming out of the sky. At a critical moment, by the way, the Japanese had had sent a wave against Midway. They were going to launch a second wave against the island, but then they said, "Oh, wait a minute! Now there, are, there are American planes around. We think we know we 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 could probably find their carriers." So they're up on the decks of these of, of these carriers. They're they're switching out bombs, which are useful for attacking islands, for torpedoes, which are better for attacking enemy ships. The planes are refueling, and by the way, the Japanese decks were made of wood. Most most carriers were at the time. There's aviation fuel all over the place. There are bombs, there are torpedoes, all you know, covering the, the decks of these ships. Those dauntless dive bombers come screaming down and within minutes, four of those four, all the four of the Japanese aircraft carriers that were present were, were in flames. So it really was a devastating, uh, devastating day in the history of the Japanese Navy. That's a turning point in the Pacific. What's our next place where the strategic initiative shifts to the Allies? Well, that would be El Alamein. And probably of the three, this is the, this is the least important. Uh, it was pretty important for the British, though. Um, the the, the uh, Axis forces under the command of Erwin Rommel, the, uh, the so-called Desert Fox, had advanced deep into, uh, into British Egypt was threatening Cairo, possibly the Suez Canal. Uh, there were, in fact, two battles of El Alamein, one in July and one in October. The one in July, the Germans were stopped, and the one in October, they were, uh, they were, forced, to, uh, they were forced to retreat. Um, I say it's, it, you know, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a pivotal battle in many ways. It certainly changes. Uh, the, the, uh, the, it, it certainly represents the shift of the strategic initiative from the Axis to, to the Allies, absolutely does that. Uh, in terms of how the war would have been different had it gone the other way, it's not clear to me that it makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, people say, well, if Rommel had kept going, he could have had the Suez Canal, he could have occupied the Middle East, he could have... Uh, it was so difficult for the Axis to supply those forces in North Africa. They really couldn't have made much more of a much more of a commitment, but I still think it deserves to be included just because it 
decisively in North Africa turns things the other way. And the, and the Axis forces in North Africa are in retreat uh, uh, ever after from that point. The one thing, of course, that some of our, our listeners may know about Al Alamein, certainly one thing I've heard at least is um, the British searched desperately and in vain and in frustrating ways to find a general who could finally take on Rommel, who, as you said, was called the Desert Fox because he was a brilliant tactician and strategist. How did they find that general and who was it? Well, uh, how they how they found him? How did they get? Where did Montgomery come from? But Bernard Law Montgomery was that uh, uh, was that man. Um, you know, I, I I I don't think Montgomery was any kind of military genius. I think um, he was beloved by his men. Uh, he was equally hated by Americans. Uh, why, why did the Americans hate him? Uh, well, for what they had an absolutely colossal ego. Uh, of course, the one who hated him most was Patton, who also had a massive, uh, a massive ego. There was there was just a huge personality conflict between the men. But but Patton was extremely daring, and Montgomery wasn't. Uh, Montgomery was the type to marshal his forces, and he said, "Okay, only when we have overwhelming superiority are we going to strike." Which is, so there were it was. July, the Germans were stopped. Montgomery just you know, built up forces until October and said, now is our, now is our opportunity. The, the, British, the British forces in North Africa really, really uh, had, had, had a huge advantage by October. So he was a good general. I, I, don't, I don't think he was, a, he was a great general. A lot of it was, was simply the, 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 uh, the, the number of forces he had at, at his command. And it's not an American prejudice. It, it, I, I, I think it's more than an, than an American prejudice. He drove Eisenhower nuts, and, and Eisenhower was like the most even-tempered guy you can imagine. <laughs> That's okay. That's North Africa, the turning point. What about the place, where else does the strategic initiative shift? There's Stalingrad. This is, the, this is a battle that gets talked about so often. Uh, what's, you know... I, had the Germans won at Stalingrad, they might still have managed to uh, to to win the war. Uh, they, there was certainly concern in 1942 that the that that the Soviets were going to get knocked out of the war. Probably in retrospect, it wasn't that as likely as it seemed at the time. But what was really key about Stalingrad, and you could see it in the lower right part of the of of, of the map, right along the Volga River there. Stalingrad was covered the flank for this big German offensive that had swept across Ukraine and headed down into uh, uh, in, into the, the the Caucasus Mountains down here in the southeast. Uh, the Germans were going to have access to uh, to Soviet oil fields, which would have been a huge coup for the German side. And they actually did occupy most of this territory, but their flank was exposed at Stalingrad. This points to another a problem that was there for the Germans, at least since the failure to take Moscow in the fall. Look at the length of this front line that extends all the way from north, the north wow. in, in Leningrad, down into this huge bulge down to the Black Sea. Yeah, I mean, it really goes from the Baltic down to the Black Sea across the entire length of Europe. Right. And... So you, you could ask the question, well, how are there enough German forces to, 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 to hold that line? Well, there aren't. Big chunks of that line are occupied by, by uh, uh, allies of the, uh, of the Germans, uh, like the, the Italians, the Romanians had a, made a major commitment to Eastern Front. And the reason why the Germans lost at Stalingrad, one of the reasons, uh, was that the areas to the north and south of Stalingrad were held by Romanian forces that were not particularly effective. They weren't particularly well equipped. Their morale was not high. Their leadership was not great. And the Soviets knew this. And so you had a substantial German force, the Sixth Army, in, in Stalingrad itself, fighting house to house, street to street to occupy the city. Then the the uh, the Soviets launched 
two-pronged offensive, one on the north of the city, one on the south. They cut through the Romanian lines like a hot knife through butter, and they link up on the other side, and the Sixth Army is, is, is cut off. Well, that's awful for the Sixth Army. They fight bravely for months. They end up surrendering in, in, at the beginning of February 1943. But even more than that, I mean, that, that, that was a, a disaster for the Germans in and of itself, because it really was, uh, it, it was the first time that large-scale German forces surrendered. Uh, but even beyond that, once Stalingrad was uh, had been decided, all of these forces that had occupied this area to the southeast, th their position was in trouble. They had to withdraw from that that from those locations entirely. And from that moment on, the Germans were mostly in retreat. They made one last. Uh, they made some local offensives, like the Battle of Kursk in 1943, uh, but those those were were in a way doomed and probably wouldn't have changed much. Stalingrad was 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 uh, was pretty darn important. John, how bitter was the fighting in Stalingrad? Well. Absolutely brutal. Uh, for one thing, it's fought over the course of the winter. For the most part, the winter was the winter would mark a lull in the fighting, uh, but not around Stalingrad. The worst of it happened was going on there. Uh, there, there was there are multiple stages to the Battle of Stalingrad. It's it's really in the summer and early fall that the real fight for the the heart of the city was. And, and 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 it was extremely uh, much of the city was destroyed in the process, uh, and then the Soviets sprang the trap surrounding the Sixth Army, and it became more like a siege at uh, at that point. But there was tremendous loss of life, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it, there's a there's, there's kind of a, an amusing story N near the very end. Uh, Hitler sent General von Paulus, the German commander of the Sixth Army, uh, a field marshal's baton and said, hey, congratulations, you're a field marshal. Uh, he, they would have much rather have rein, had reinforcements, but they couldn't get reinforcements. So they managed to airdrop a package to General von Paulus saying, you're promoted to field marshal. And by the way, no field marshal in the history of the German army has ever surrendered. Hint, hint, hint. Uh, well, it didn't make a difference. They uh, uh, surrendered. They uh, uh, Paula surrendered it at the beginning of February '43. Then, in the so in the in the Pacific, in North Africa, and now in the Eastern Front, uh, the tide turns against the Axis. The Allies start the march. We get into this third category of turning points that you talked about, which is battles that. If they might not have changed the direction of the war, or the outcome of the war, but if they had gone differently, the war would have definitely taken a different turn, a different shape. What yeah. are those battles? Yeah, well, the first is, is one we've already talked about, Pearl Harbor. As I said, had those repair facilities and, and water storage, uh, or sorry, uh, 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 oil storage tanks and, uh, and the carriers been destroyed, that would have been a would have been a major setback. I still think the United States would have won, but we're talking at least another year before uh, uh, it, it would have it, it would have taken that long for uh, the United States to to have recovered from the blow. I would think. So that that that's that's one of them. The second I would add is Guadalcanal, and Guadalcanal is in the Solomon Islands. You can see it. It's the easternmost uh, of the Solomon Islands that's shaded in brown, because it's as far as the Japanese got in uh, advancing through that chain. And when we were talking about Pearl Harbor, we mentioned how the, the the Japanese strategy was to deliver a crushing blow against the uh, against the Pacific Fleet, and then use the time that that bought them to occupy as much real estate as they possibly could, to grab territory that would yield resources that the, that the Japanese armed forces needed, especially oil, but also to grab territory that could be used as uh, air bases uh, for further operations. And one of the areas where the Japanese uh, moved most successfully 
was north of Australia. And their goal here was to cut the communications link between Australia and the United States. And the Solomon Islands, uh, the Solomon Islands were, were key to doing that. And as you can see, they, they had managed to, to, to reach Guadalcanal, but they'd only gotten there a few weeks before U.S. forces did. Uh, and they were unable really to establish themselves all that well. This gets me to one of the great unsung heroes of the Allied cause in World War II, the bulldozer. Uh, the, you don't the think bulldozer? about it, the bulldozer. Oh, okay. It, it, weapon of war, because the Japanese seized islands. Many of these islands had no particular economic value. They didn't produce resources that were uh, that were needed, but they were seized because the Japanese called them unsinkable aircraft carriers. We establish airfields on them, and then that allows us to project our power outward. Well, the only the tools with which the, 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 that were at the, the disposal of the Japanese for building airfields were picks and shovels. They were just out there breaking up rocks and clearing and, and, and clearing terrain. And as a result, it would take them months to establish an airfield. US forces would get there right behind the cop. Once, you know, once the area had been pacified, the bulldozers came in, they would have an airfield up and running within a matter of days. Uh, so this was a significant advantage that it gave to the United States. And, uh, and, and, and so even though the Japanese beat the United States to Guadalcanal, uh, they were not able to establish their, uh, uh, their air bases. Any aircraft that the Japanese were able to fly there were from islands that were further away. So in fact, Japanese planes were operating kind of at the limit of their, uh, of, of their, of their range. Uh, whereas, uh, it, U.S. aircraft were able to uh, were, were able to get more have, were able to achieve dominance over the area. Uh, had Guadalcanal gone the other way, or had the United States not gotten to Guadalcanal? By the way, if Midway had gone the other way, there's no chance the United States would have would have been able to land on Guadalcanal in uh, in in uh, August of 1942. By the way, Battle of Guadalcanal was happening pretty much exactly when Stalingrad was from the late summer of 1942 until February of 19, uh, February of 1943. Like Stalingrad, the fighting on Guadalcanal was absolutely bitter. Uh, but in February of 1943, the Japanese, uh, Japanese withdrew. Had they been able to overrun the Solomon Islands, there's a very good chance that they could have cut off the, uh, the, the communications link between the United States and, and, and Australia. Uh, that was a very important, uh, a very important link for Allied logistics. A again, I don't know that it that it would have changed the ultimate outcome, but it was uh, it, it it was really good for the United States that uh, that, that 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 they won at Guadalcanal. Uh, we have a question. Uh, we're getting several. We have several questions, of course. But one question connected to this is, what about Japanese kamikazes? Now that's later in the war. But is that a, a situation? Could that have possibly turned the tide back in Japan's favor in any way? No, it was an absolute act of desperation. Uh, the, the thought was that, 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 that the, the kamikazes could inflict so much damage that uh, the United States would accept a, uh, uh, some kind of compromise peace instead of victory. I, I don't see any, any likelihood that that, was, uh, that that was going to happen. What about our, your third in this last category of turning? Well, turn? I actually have four in this category. Four, okay. Uh, let's see if we get to them all. Uh, the third is the Normandy invasion. Um, the Normandy invasion certainly could have gone the other way. Uh, naval invasions are notoriously tricky this was on a massive scale a scale unlike any that had been that had been seen before uh in fact you probably i'm sure you know that uh eisenhower had a draft of a letter that he was planning to send had the had the operation failed where he took full responsibility for it fortunately that was the letter that he never had to send uh had it gone the other way 
it's hard to imagine when the Allies could have made another try to land in the West. Now, the Allies still would have won World War II, but the real benefactor of this was probably would probably have been Stalin. Uh, had had this had the Soviets because it was clear uh, it, it was clear that the that, that the Soviets were going to win the war in the East that they were going to that they were going to roll over uh, that they were going to roll over Germany. The question is how far would they have gotten? Uh, there is an excellent chance, had the Normandy operation not happened, that the, that the Soviets would have gone into France. Uh, they could have rolled all the way across the continent, really. There was no, yeah. no, particular, no, no one in particular that could have stopped them. And that would have been, obviously, a, complete, a dramatic change in the post-war situation of Europe. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, um, it, it's interesting that it's here, though, because you think, had the operation not succeeded, in the landing at Normandy, w was there a plan or an idea? Well, then we'll try somewhere else to invade in France. Um, yeah, I mean that would have that that would have happened. The thing is, those there was so much planning that went into this. I mean, plans for plans for the Normandy invasion took uh, it took about a year, and th this is uh, apart from. Uh, the, the forces that would have been lost had the operation been a, been a disaster. Uh, it, 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 it would have been at least some months before there could have been another try. And you might say, well, there were landings in, you know, they, by that time, Allied forces were in Italy. That's true. But the course of the war in Italy was so slow that it wasn't likely to, you know, to make much of a, uh, much of a difference. Along these lines, a, a listener has asked, and this is, of course, much earlier in the war, but asking you, do you consider Dunkirk in any way a turning point? Of course, that happens near here in northwestern France as the British are encircled and then have to retreat back to Britain when the fall of France. Does Dunkirk qualify in any way as a turning point? I don't think it does. I think Dunkirk... Uh... It, it, in many ways, it, it's in many ways Dunkirk was uh, was was not a victory. I mean, it was it was certainly good that so many British troops managed to escape, but they left all their heavy equipment behind. Uh, it, it, you know, it had had Dunkirk gone the other way, it would have complicated things in a number of ways. Certainly, that there would have been fewer. Uh, uh, British Army troops available to defend the home islands. However, there was, in the absence of a German invasion, those troops were not, you know, were not needed to defend the, uh, uh, to defend British soil. Uh, some would end, end up in North Africa, of course, and, and, and that made a difference there, although a, a large contingent in North Africa were from Australia and New Zealand. So, uh, it, you know, it's certainly a good thing for Britain. It was a much needed shot in the arm for morale that these that these men escaped. Uh, but the uh, the fate of Great Britain in late 1940 and early 1941 was in the hands of the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force and not in the Army. What about what about your fourth battle turning point in this last category? The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's not a traditional. It's not something that's traditionally mentioned as a turning point. And again, it's not as though the Japanese weren't going to lose without the atomic bombs. But it's pretty clear that the war would have gone on for considerably longer without them. Uh, the, 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 the Japanese uh, cabinet was, was divided on surrender. The emperor was not ruling one way or the other on it. Civilian leadership was saying this has to end. Military leadership said, no, the disgrace would be too great. Uh, we just have to let this play out and see how much damage we can inflict on the enemy, and, and maybe they'll back away from the demand for unconditional surrender. Uh, certainly, if you look at the discussions that went on before it was clear that the atomic bomb was going to be available, all the planners assumed that the war was going to go on into 1946. 
Uh, in fact, that's when that's when the landings in Kyushu were supposed to happen. But even even if even after an, an invasion of Kyushu, the understanding was well, then we're going to have to land on the on on Honshu as well. The, on, on, that is the main island. So it, this the war could have gone on much much longer. If you look at every other alternative scenario for ending the ending the war, uh, they all likely would have taken months, if not years, more. So again, it's not an instance where the, 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 the overall outcome of the war would have changed, but it's certainly without the atomic bombs, it would have taken longer. Now, you mentioned before, John, The Man in the High Castle, that book, and of course became a television series based on the hypothetical that what if Hitler had gotten the atomic bomb first? What about that as a turning point? The United States not only dropping the bomb, but getting the bomb and Hitler not getting it. Was there any circumstance under which Hitler could have gotten possession of the atomic bomb and changed the war? Yeah, I, I think this this is this is where we see the limits of counterfactual history. I, I I'm a big fan of counterfactual history. I think we can learn a lot by considering alternative uh, alternative outcomes. But those alternative outcomes have to be, in order for for it to to be a useful exercise, they have to be plausible. And I think. That, that Hitler getting the atomic bomb was entirely implausible for, for two reasons, um, lack of talent and lack of resources. Uh, and, and, and this is, this is it really uh, illustrates how uh, Nazi ideology worked against the, uh, the, the Nazi war effort. Uh, so many brilliant European physicists had found their way out of Europe to the United States uh, that, 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 that I mean the, the 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 colossal amount of brain power that was concentrated in the United States in the early 1940s was nothing short of of incredible. It's not to say there weren't smart physicists in Germany. Werner Heisenberg was uh, the best among them, and he was the leading figure in the German bomb project. But uh, and and of course it was a concern during the war. Uh, there's a famous letter to FDR by Albert Einstein even before, uh, I think it was, was it 1939, saying, you know, the Germans are working on an atomic bomb, just so you know. Uh, maybe you guys ought to be looking into coming up with one first. Uh, but we know now that, uh, that, 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 that the, the project had not gotten very far at all. Uh, one was the disadvantage in terms, of, in terms of talent. The other was a matter of resources. Um, the United States threw massive, massive resources behind the Manhattan Project. I mean, because the United States had the resources. Germany was, uh, the, the Hitler liked to invest in technology. He was fascinated with coming up with the latest weapon, but he was kind of all over the place. Uh, he had tons, he, he was directing money into all sorts of projects. The atomic bomb was just one of them and wasn't even the most interesting from Hitler's perspective. He was much more interested in jet fighters and, and, and ever heavier tanks than he was in, in the atomic bomb. Now, you know, had he had more resources been, been put into it, uh, I still, I mean, I, I don't think those kind of resources were, of, were, were, were even available to Germany, since you know, especially when it was fighting for its life in the last couple of years of the war. Uh, a couple, a question here. One, both connected to, uh, well, one connected to Hitler. What, what do you think would have happened if Hitler had, instead of, uh, had made the concentration camps dedicated forced labor camps rather than extermination camps? Could that have helped? And again, that was contrary to Nazi yeah. evil ideology, but yeah. would that have made any difference? Um, probably not, because the thing is, forced labor is notoriously unreliable and unproductive. Uh, it, it, it could not, it, it, it could have made a little bit of difference at the margin. Yeah, maybe. Um, but, but the, the, the policy by and large was really only to exterminate those who were deemed incapable of serious work. So it's not as though everybody upon arrival at even at Auschwitz was sent to a was sent to a gas chamber. 
uh, the ones who were who were believed to be capable of doing of performing slave labor were sent out. So, I mean, they were the, the plan was to kill them eventually, uh, but but it, it's not it, it's not so much an either or either exterminate or get them to work. To get them, the, the idea was to get them to work, get those who they thought were able to work, uh, working until they would be exterminated later. So it was it was it was mainly ch uh, women and children and the elderly who were who. You know, at the, at the height of the final solution, were being gassed upon arrival. Uh, another one counterfactual. You you alluded to this, but uh, a student is asking, what about if the Japan had declared war on the USSR, and that that had been part of the Eastern theater? Would that have changed anything? Uh, maybe. It, 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 Probably only indirectly, uh, in the sense that it could have it, 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 that that an attack on uh, uh, Eastern Siberia would have prevented Stalin from transferring those forces to uh, forces to Moscow. I, looking back on Japanese decision making in 1941, I think it's highly unlikely that the Japanese were going to attack the Soviets, mainly because they. There had been two clashes between Soviet and Japanese forces in the 1930s, one in 1938 and one in 1939, and they both were disastrous for the Japanese. So the Japanese had developed a healthy respect for, uh, uh, for the Red Army in the East. And added to that is the fact that the conclusion was there was really nothing for them to gain in Eastern Siberia. It just seemed like wasteland to them. Meanwhile, in Southeast Asia was the oil, the rubber, the tin, all the all these resources that they needed to continue the war against China, which was really the the uh, the, the ultimate prize. So, yeah, uh, it, it, it could have made a difference, but I don't see the Japanese ever choosing that option. Looking back at all of these turning points, you're as a historian and sort of thinking comprehensively about this. Is there a lesson that you take from this? and looking at these various turning points, an overall insight, idea, or lesson? Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it, this, this may be completely pedestrian, um, but don't engage in a war of aggression against enemies who have a much more developed industrial sector than you have. Uh, even you know this was the, this was the case with the Germans attacking the Soviets. It was the case with the um, uh, with with the the Japanese attacking the United States. Uh, it, it, Germany was kind of a second rate in, industrial power in some ways. I mean, yeah, it was produced more than France, but uh, did not produce as much as as Great Britain, and certainly not as much as the Soviet Union or uh, or the United States. Uh, uh, Japan produced a, a fraction of what of what Germany did. So again, both both the Germans and the Japanese thought they could make up for this by quick action and just you know striking so fast and so hard, like Cobra Kai, that they could uh, that, 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 that they could cripple the enemy before they would have a chance to respond. And that was the and that was the big mistake in all of those cases. As I said, uh, closer to the outset, once it became clear that this was going to be a long war that was going to be fought in years rather than months, it was pretty clear that the Axis could not win. And I think probably another lesson, as you alluded to earlier, was um, don't underestimate the spirit of the United States and the willingness of the American people and it's their leadership to fight when attacked. That is certainly the, certainly the case. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or the British for that matter. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Well, J John, fascinating. This has been an amazing tour through <laughs> World War II. Such interesting thinking here, historically, strategically. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us for the conversation. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, a, a recording, a link to a recording of this uh, webinar will be available for you all. And we'll have links to the maps. So you want to take a look at those. 
please pass the link on to friends, family, colleagues, people who'd be really interested in this subject. It's a rare opportunity for us to talk with an expert like John, who knows this so thoroughly backwards and forwards. And for those of you who don't know, take a look at ashbrook.org if you want to know more about what we do for teachers, tah.org, teachingamericanhistory.org, uh, terrific resources for you all. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this Pearl Harbor Day as we remember those who served and sacrificed for our country. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org. <laughs>